guys um, suffered through grad school together, uh, but in different departments, um, and uh, we were all part of a group of friends. Um, so Chris is now an associate professor of applied math at Columbia University and the chief data scientist at the New York Times. Um, one of the coolest things I think that he has done is that he's the co-founder and co-organizer of Pack NY, and he used to describe this as keeping kids off the street. So Chris, it's a pleasure to have you here. Wonderful to see you after all these years. So as advertised, uh, oh wait, I am turning around. Now it's on. Better? Good. OK, so um, thank you, Anna, for that kind intro. Yes, we suffered through graduate school together at Princeton in different departments. Anna was in math. I was in physics. Ingrid was kind enough to name us both on honorary applied math graduate students, if I remember correctly, because we spent a bunch of time in Fine Hall. Um, uh, yes, so as advertised, I'm Chris Wiggins, and I'm splitting my time between the New York Times and Columbia, uh, and also Hack and Why, as, as Anna mentioned. So um, let's start out. I can tell you a little bit about what I mean by these words and how I got that way. Um, in particular, let's start out by thinking about what I mean by data science, which is a word that wasn't being used very much um, maybe 15 years ago and now is being used by lots of people to mean lots of different things. Uh, my own particular view on data science was very shaped by my own background. So uh, my own background was um, going to graduate school and being interested in trying to take methods and mindset from physics and use those to try better to understand biology. So um, just so I know my audience, how many people know what the thing on the left is? OK. And how many people know what the thing on the right is? The genome. OK, so the thing on the left is Haemophilus influenzae, and it was first seen in a, in a scope in 1892. The thing on the right was the cover image of Science Magazine in, uh, I think, believe July of 1995, if I remember correctly. And I can still remember being in the Burger King on Nassau Street uh, with some other graduate students. And Tim Holly walked in carrying Science Magazine. He was like, this is going to change biology. Because once this is the first freely living organism to get its genome sequenced. And uh, some people realized right away that once you can sequence Haemophilus, that means you're going to be able to sequence C. elegans and Drosophila, and then eventually mice, and then eventually humans. And then you're going to be able to sequence multiple humans. And then you're going to turn biology into a very statistical science, a very data-driven science. Right? Um, and what's been fun over the last 10 years or 15 years is to see the pain that biology went through, um, 1998 through 2005, happen in so many other fields where you have, say, a century of understanding the world in a particular way, and suddenly you find yourself awash in data, and you don't have like f equals ma. You don't have some sort of simple fundamental models, and you compare the data to that fundamental model. You have to find other ways of, of relating your understanding of the world to a bunch of data. So um, my sense for that was, was that biology really changed for good. And I, I didn't really recognize it at the time, but many other people around me did. Um, you know, Not long thereafter, I remember visiting Stanford and, and in Pat Brown's lab. A bunch of real biologists were learning about Perl, and they had Excel spreadsheets on their computers. And it was, it was just weird. Right? It was, you, were, you were not supposed to be seeing Perl books in biology labs, in real biology labs at that time. Um, part of that was, was from a change in tool set. So an, another thing that I think has been common in many fields is that first you have a change in technology, and then it causes you to have a change in mindset. So some new tool opens up your field in a, lot of, in a new way of asking new questions about it. Uh, and that, that causes people to rethink what actually are they doing. So in 1993, when I showed up in graduate school, I think biologists felt like people who were doing modeling were sort of you know, entertaining as long as they didn't get in the way of, of real science. Uh, and then and around the time that I finished my PhD, five years later, you get things like Shirley Tillman, who at the time was a, a professor of biology before she became president of, uh, Stanford, of Princeton, um, writing things like, this is a totally new challenge. It's a bit like when DNA sequencing happened. And uh, we are going to need to collaborate with people outside biology. We're going to have to collaborate with people who know how to make sense of the world through data. So that, that, was, um, that was very different. You know, by the time I finished my PhD, biologists were really interested in collaborating with people who knew how to make sense of the world from data. And those people were coming from a, a bunch of different fields. You also had fun things like you know, leaders of the field saying, why should I need to have a hypothesis to get an R01 from NIH? Why can't I just gather all the data 
and then the data will reveal unto me all the possible hypotheses and their p-values. So uh, at the time, it just seemed like you know a lot of bluster. But if you think about it from like a history of science perspective, you know suddenly really people were thinking about like what even is the scientific method and how do I how do I apply it when I'm faced with all these data. Um, so that um, was an exciting time, and uh, I think it caused many of us to look at the questions we were interested in answering from biology and ask what is the right tool set to deal with um, large volume data sets, high dimensional data sets, and to try to relate um, the kind of statistical methods that people were using for high dimensional data sets to questions coming from the natural science. Um, so an example of, of how one might do this, uh, recent work with, uh, well, not that recent anymore, but I was working with a, at the medical school with somebody studying viruses, and he was interested in knowing for um, flu that was emerging in the human population, whether the flu was a, a pig flu or a swine flu, a pig flu or a bird flu. And the way he was doing it was by trying to learn phylogenetic trees, which is really hard. And it's also hard to know if my phylogenetic tree is better than your phylogenetic tree. And then once you do a phylogenetic tree for all the viral genomes, you can take a new genome and say, where would I sit it in that tree? And I said, why don't we do a very different type of tree? Why don't we do a decision tree? in which we just want an algorithm that can tell you for a new genome, was it built, was it, um, has it been evolving in a pig or has it been evolving in a bird? And then you, you sort of do away with uh, everything making sense in biology in light of evolution. You just say, look, can I build an algorithm that makes accurate predictions on held out data? Uh, and of course, you want something that's not just accurate, but also interpretable. So um, as an example, we made a decision tree based on the presence or absence of little um, protein elements in the protein of this um, flu, and I bring this up as, as um, sort of a, um, a touchstone to keep in mind as I start talking about things that have nothing to do with biology, but just to say, part of what I think people who come from the natural sciences where you, you've made sense of things through data bring to other fields, even in industry, is the ability to take a domain that's been thinking about itself for a long time, suddenly finds itself awash in a bunch of data, and try to figure out what is the right way to reframe that data reframe the natural science question in terms of, say, a machine learning task and do it in a way that's not only statistically accurate but is interpretable to the person coming from the domain. Um, so it was, a, it was a fun time in biology. Um, and I, one of the things that I think my collaborators and I experienced was grabbing the right tool for the right job, which often, in my view, is coming from machine learning, including methods that were built for things that have nothing to do with the natural sciences. Sometimes these things were coming from computational problems, industrial problems, and the challenge was to figure out how to use those problems in an applied computational sense. Um, and that, that sort of uh, pain that a field has when it's awash in data is, is largely what I mean by data science. So um, the term, though, data science, has a slightly older history than the last five years. It's actually an ancient term. So here's an ancient document from 2001 um, by Bill Cleveland. Now, uh, how many people here know who Bill Cleveland is? Good. Only the people who did time at AT&T. So um, Bill, what, what is, he's still alive, Purdue, uh, a heretical statistician, and he's part of a, a long lineage of AT&T and Bell Labs heretical statisticians, whereby you can look back at the literature and you can see people at Bell Labs publish a paper roughly once every decade from 1962 until 2001 where they publish a paper saying, there is a huge gulf between statistics as it was handed to us by Fisher and Neyman and applied computational statistics as we've been doing it in the labs. So this is one of those papers. Um, it's a paper by Bill Cleveland, and he, and he says, let's make up a new field. Let's call it data science. Uh, and he goes through and talks about what data science is, and, and many of, much of which reads in a very modern way. Uh, of course, what's fun about the article is he says, when I say we should do something differently, I mean you should do something differently. All of these articles, not almost all of these articles are written from the perspective of somebody in AT&T or Bell Labs saying, you academic statistics departments should change what you're doing. This is one of those. Um, another ancient document that I think really shaped what I think about when I think about data science comes also from industry. Note Bill, although he's in Purdue now, he was writing from the perspective of somebody in industry. Another piece um, from industry that shaped my thinking was this piece by Jeff Hammerbacher. How many people have heard of Jeff Hammerbacher? Okay, so Jeff, um, after he graduated Harvard in 2004, he went to Bear Stearns for a year, got bored, called his classmate Mark Zuckerberg, said, Mark, what are you doing? Mark said, we have a lot of data. And Jeff went and set up basically the first BI team at um, 
at Facebook, and then he retired about four years later. And when he retired, he had time on his hands, and he wrote this nice essay about sort of the history of business intelligence and data platforms. And he says, um, at Facebook, we felt that traditional titles such as business analyst, statistician, research scientist didn't quite capture it because we had people on our team who would do all this diversity of things. And it's fun to read this diverse list from 10 years ago and compare it to what a data scientist might do today. Uh, might do hypothesis testing, data pipelines in Python, regression in R, or building a product in Hadoop, and communicating the results of our analyses in a clear and concise fashion. So almost everything there has changed quite a bit. So uh, weapons grade statistical software in Python has gotten real good, and you'd probably be doing your, your regression in Python. Um, data pi data pipeline, processing pipeline in Python is still happening. Um, Hadoop is happening, but you don't know it anymore, meaning there is a distributed MapReduce job happening, but it's like it's Amazon's problem or it's Google's problem. Like you're typing SQL queries into BigQuery, and Google has figured out how to distribute that query across um, all of Nebraska, wherever they keep their machines, and give you a result. The one thing that I, I would say still is this case is com communicating your results in a clear and concise fashion. That is part of what I think people are, are talking about when they differentiate, say, machine learning from data science. They want somebody who's going to be willing to work with somebody from a different domain, listen to them speak in their domain's language, because you know, you're working with people who don't speak calculus, translate their real problems into machine learning tasks, execute the machine learning in a way that's statistically valid and yet interpretable to the end user or your collaborator, your co-author, your co-PI, and then translate it back to somebody in a way that advances their field. Um, which is why this other cartoon is, is another cartoon that I found useful for thinking about data science. This is a cartoon from my friend Drew, Con Drew Conway. At the time, he was a graduate student in political science at NYU, and he was listening to a bunch of people in New York talk about data science, and he said, well, it seems like what you're really talking about is combining machine learning with some application domain. And that's still the way I think about data science, is that there's a craft of taking somebody from some substantive domain, whether it's biology or publishing or baseball or whatever, and they have some problem, they have a lot of data, and you need to work with them to figure out how to recast that data in terms of some machine learning task execute it, and then help them use that machine learning task to understand their field. Uh, just because as long as I've put up this graph, hacking skills here does not mean breaking into things. It means the pre-1983 definition of hacking, which is a creative solution to a technical problem. Uh, and danger zone means danger zone. If you torture the data, they will confess to anything. So you, you need to have some principles um, when you try to make sense of data. OK, so now I've said what I mean by data science in general. Um, and I've said a few words about how it was shaped by my understanding of working with biological data sets and also working with biologists. Uh, let me say how you might do data science at a place like the New York Times. So uh, first, I have to tell you about the New York Times. Um, many of you don't think of the New York Times as a place where you would have data science. It's reasonable if this is what you think of when you think of the New York Times. This is a birth picture of the New York Times on the first day it was born as the New York Daily Times in 1851 in the form of a dead tree. And to be clear, the New York Times still makes dead trees. It's, it's still happening. Um, but if I want to tell you where the data science team sits within the org chart of the New York Times, I need to show you the org chart of the New York Times. So here's the org chart of the New York Times. Um, <laughs> so on the left are the people who possess and defend the craft of journalism. In fact, right now, they're all standing on the third floor celebrating a few uh, Pulitzer Prizes. Um, those people have bylines. They have deadlines. They work very, very hard. On the other side is everything else. And to make clear, I'm on the everything else, sometimes called the, B, the business side or the B side. Uh, and that is where data sits, as well as other sort of horizontal surfaces. So I want to make that clear first because Sometimes I go through a talk and I talk about machine learning and then people say, how do you do those graphics? And I say, those people are awesome. I'm not on that team. So, uh, I want to make that clear. Uh, instead, we're in one of what's called a horizontal group. So there are some groups that um, are useful to the whole company or try to be useful to the whole company. So we are in a group called data that contains um, data analysts, many, many data analysts, fewer data scientists, and a data governance team. And I'll try to make clear what those different groups do. Uh, but one of the things the group is charged with is trying to be useful to everyone in the company. There are, there are data problems on the business side. There are data problems in the newsroom side. Uh, and we we'll, we try to make that useful. Specifically, the tagline I use internally is that the goal of the data science team is to develop and deploy 
machine learning solutions to newsroom and business problems. So part of what I mean by, if I can just parse this briefly, what I mean by develop and deploy is, um, so I've, I've hired several people to do this. What, what I want is people who know how to develop new machine learning methods, but I also want them to know how to write enough code that we can integrate our machine learning into people's practice. So I first showed up there in the fall of 90, 20, 2013. I decided to do a sabbatical, and I took my sabbatical at the Times. And um, I, you know, th there wasn't a, like a data science team, so I just tried to put my head down and be an individual contributor and write some really bad code in, in R. And at the end, not the end, but like after a few months, we had produced a report in PDF because that's the way I was raised, right? Like you, you have a PDF, and that's mission accomplished. And people say, OK, well, that's great. Um, what are we going to do with that? And I said, well, I don't know. There's a PDF. That's, that's, that's what you do. Uh, and then I realized that if you actually have to, if you actually want to integrate machine learning into practice, you, this is really just the start. So now I'm trying to hire people who know how not only to develop machine learning methods, but understand how to deploy it as a product or a service, a GUI, a Slack bot, an API, something people can use. And I'll, I'll talk about examples of that. Um, one way of thinking about the different things that we do is to think about some of the things we do as acts of description, some of the things we do as acts of prediction, and some of the things we do as prescription, by which I mean actual decision support. There are times when somebody comes to you and says, here's all my customers. Tell me which ones are the NASCAR moms and which ones are soccer dads. They want a simplified description. Sometimes people come to you and they say, we want you to predict what's going to happen in the absence of treatment. Like, we want you to predict which subscribers are going to cancel. But often they tell you that, but what they really want to know is, we want to know what is the optimal treatment we should do to these people in order to get some sort of outcome. What they really want is some decision support. And if you're willing to work with them and help them think through things, um, that's often what they really want is some sort of prescription. That's a little different from the sciences. Often in the sciences, you just want to understand something. Um, maybe if you're in engineering or you're a doctor, you might want to know what is the best thing to do. But rarely uh, are you trying to get the bacterium to do something differently. Often you're just trying to understand why the bacterium does what it does. So that's what I talk about um, when I talk about my group outside of my group at the New York Times. Like if I'm talking to marketing or edit editorial. But internal to the group, I say, don't tell anybody. But these are really unsupervised learning, supervised learning, and reinforcement learning. <laughs> So that's sort of an internal code I use for my group, like which literature should you be looking at, which module from Python should you be importing. Usually, if somebody's asking for a description, they just want you to cluster. Usually, if somebody wants for a prediction, we have supervised learning as an arsenal. Usually, if somebody wants decision support, we have a, a tool set from reinforcement learning we can use to at least frame the problem. Um, but those words make sense to people. And, and I didn't actually make up those words. These are words taken from the business world. So here's an infographic from Gartner. From 2012, Gartner is a company that business people pay to explain to them how things work. Uh, and so they have this infographic about different types of um, uh, analyses. And you see descriptive, predictive, and prescriptive on there. Michael Littman actually pointed out this graphic to me in 2012. Uh, Tinder is not here today, but um, Littman works on reinforcement learning. And he said, I like this infographic because the stuff I do is both most difficult and most valuable. Uh, <laughs> kind of true, that like, that's really where the reinforcement learning stuff happens. And not everybody in machine learning has this field. Generally, if you ask people in machine learning what's the most valuable thing in machine learning, they will say, the thing that I do. I can, I can, show, you, I can show you quotes for that effect from, from many leaders. But I do think that if you work with people hard enough, usually what, what they really want is some help making a difficult decision. Um, from the perspective of a database analyst, or from the perspective of somebody who has a table, the descriptive problems are problems where you have a bunch of rows and you have a bunch of columns that describe entities. And you want some simpler description, like these are the soccer moms. Um, uh, predictive problems are ones where you have a bunch of columns, and one of those columns really matters much more than the other columns. One column is sacred, and your job is to predict that column from every other column. That's the way I talk about predictive problems at the times. And prescriptive problems are ones where you have two sacred columns. One is everything you're allowed to know before you've made a decision. Another is what decision you made. And another is did you win or lose? Like what happened? What was the outcome? And so for problems where you're trying not to predict what's going to happen in the absence of treatment, but instead to decide what is the treatment that would optimize some outcome, those really I think of as prescriptive problems. Of course, um, all of these things have a temporal order also. You know, Sometimes you just get your hands on your data set for the first time. You don't even know what question to ask. You are in the, phrase of, you are in the frame of what John Tukey called exploratory data analysis. 
And unsupervised learning is a, is a great tool for just making sense of the data or the people or whatever, whatever you have. As you watch people do what you do, what they do, and you care about some, and you know what you actually care about, like genes going up and down or people canceling their subscription, then you have the opportunity to observe and to predict. Once you've decided what you are willing to do to them to get them to subscribe, then you have the opportunity to test out different things, uh, and then you can turn that into an optimization problem. And of course, the same rules apply as in science. You know, you, you do something and then you realize that this doesn't work out the way I said why not? This didn't work at all. And then you go back and you, um, you have new ways of exploring and thinking about other things that were left out of the problem. OK, so what are some examples of these different things? Um, descriptive modeling. Descriptive modeling can be used for a variety of things. At the times we have used it, for example, for recommendation problems. So one of the recommendation engines that we've built um, was this tool that took all of the corpus of articles and broke it into different topics. This is a type of modeling called topic modeling, uh, in which an article about, um, say, a movie review could be classified as solidly about art. Um, something about the Iraq war would be solidly classified as politics. And something about the Frick Museum with a renovation plan is somewhere in the middle. It's got a little bit of both. Why is that useful? Well, um, in news, the, the news is always new. And so you have constant cold start problem. Uh, when you try to recommend things to people, you, you put it out there and you don't have a history of how people have engaged with that thing. But for a given person, if I know you like to engage with these topics, then I can make some educated guess that you're likely to like this new thing because it's got those topics in it. This is based on, I mean, this is, a, this is a well understood branch of machine learning, which is generative modeling in which there's a latent variable. Um, we, um, my, the person who's got the office next to me, I said to him one day, why don't you come down to the Times and give a talk about how to do this, and uh, about a year later, uh, we had implemented this as a, as a recommendation engine, where we have a latent variable model that says, if you're from these topics, here's the probability you omit these words, and here's the probability that somebody who likes those topics is going to engage with this article. So it was a combined latent variable model. Um, this, was, this is a well-studied way of dealing with uh, text from a variety of fields, including in work in electronic health records. So putting on my Columbia hat, we had also used this type of technique for making sense of electronic health records where you have a bunch of patients, a doctor is interested in some very quick summary, and Topic Models gives you a way of rendering it. And then instead of presenting the entire medical record, you can say, here's a summary uh, color coded by, based on what topics seem to be showing up. So you, rep, you instantly give a visual summary of the entire um, phenotype of that person, the disease phenotype of that person. Um, another thing you can do with that sort of descriptive model is to give people exploratory tools for understanding for example, who reads what where. So if I want to say, what are they reading, a topic model is a natural choice. If I want to say, where are they, I need to join that with some um, lat long information from where they're reading. If I want to say who they are, I could use, for example, uh, third party data sources that say this person is a business decision maker or something. So for us, we built this as a prototype Flask app, and it was just sort of a science fair project. And then our friends in advertising said, sweet, we can monetize that. And suddenly I had two front end developers and two project managers, and it was a, sole, a whole team where they built out this thing called ReaderScope, uh, which they now show to marketing people. So now when um, people who are marketers from some company want to go to the New York Times, and they come to the New York Times and say, like, who even are your readers? We can say, well, here's the topics that people read about in Los Angeles, uh, and here's the topics that business decision makers read, or here's what city the business decision makers are somewhere else. So um, that was weird. You know, I'm, I'm not used to having somebody say, great, let's give you a bunch of front end developers and build that thing out. But that was pretty fun. Um, so those, examples, those are examples of descriptive tools. Um, what are examples of prediction? Uh, well, the very first day I was at the New York Times, I tried to listen carefully, tried to understand what people were most scared of, and then said, I will build you a model that will predict that. And the thing that people were most scared of is subscribers canceling. So I said, no problem. Let's build a model that predicts which subscribers are going to cancel. So um, yeah, that was like July of 2013. And by August of 2013, we had done that. And we built a model and um, showed you know, statistical significance on held out data. And they said, OK, but what are the, um, I don't want to know what are the at-risk individuals. I want to know what are the risky behaviors. So then I had to build a model that was not only predictive but interpretable in terms of features of the way people browse. So I can't tell you what the super cool stuff is, but that was part of the um, predictive power versus interpretability challenges. What they really want is some interpretation. Now, fortunately, I had already had conversations with biologists like that. So like in 2005 or so, when I was trying to build models of the genes going up and down, 
I can remember going to visit a senior gene per, uh, yeast person and saying, okay, I have the statistical significance. And he said, I don't really care. I really want to know what are the binding sites because I want to know what experiments I should do next. So um, this is a long-standing problem for people who try to make sense of data. Uh, and as I grew older, I realized, of course, somebody had already written about that. So there's a great article. If you want to, if you want to read an, a view of somebody trying to exhort their peers to think about this, there's a great article by Leo Bryman, another heretical statistician, not of Bell Labs. Uh, Leo was a proper mathematical status, a mathematical probabilist at UCLA, and then he left to go wander the earth, and ended up working with you know EPA and DoD, and invented things like random forests and CART. And then he sort of came back to academia and spent a lot of his last years writing essays about how people in statistics departments should pay more attention to this new thing called machine learning. So one of the things that he writes about is the balance between predictive power and interpretability. Sometimes you want one of each. Another prediction problem. Um, the New York Times still ships dead trees. Um, so we print a bunch of newspapers, and we send those newspapers to stores that sell them, um, which may not seem very glamorous. But um, one of the things that we did was to build out models that do that um, in a way that saves multiple data scientist salaries. So the way, when I got there, this was done using a handful of heuristics encoded in COBOL. Um, and now this is basically being driven by scikit-learn and Python. Um, and we can do careful A-B tests where we actually give different stores different allocation policies and scientifically prove that we are saving multiple data scientist salaries, which is good. Um, another prediction problem coming from just efficiencies is trying to take images and make them appropriate to become ink. So an image, as you may know, is a file. So thousands of images a day are processed by editors in order to become ink. Uh, and many of them come out of the camera not necessarily perfectly balanced for sp spraying different ink on dead trees. And so editors work very hard and patiently point and click on these images. Um, and on route, they've produced this exhaust of an abundance of before and after images so that we can use a deep learning model to train what an infinitely patient photo editor would do in order to rebalance um, the photos. So now we have a, a real warm start. Rather than starting with cold start, we can say, OK, we can build a deep learning model that emulates what you would do if you were very patient. And now you can just start from this prediction. Um, another prediction problem um, is uh, I was talking to one of my bosses. I've, I've had like six bosses there. But I was talking to one of my bosses years ago. And she said, wouldn't it be great if we could build better prediction for recommendation by knowing which stories are sort of like the heavy serious news stories and which ones are the light and entertaining stories? And I said, well, that would be cool, but I fight with the data I have, not the data I want. And so then we had a summer intern who was an undergraduate working with me at Columbia. And uh, for her summer, she came and worked in the New York Times. And we did this crazy experiment where we asked, by, we crowdsourced. We asked people to say which feelings they felt when they read these stories. Uh, and then we showed that you can actually predict that with statistical significance. And uh, then she left, and she went on to her, her real job in the fall. And I showed it to my friends in advertising, and they said, Sweet, we can monetize that. And suddenly, <laughs> suddenly I had a bunch of back-end engineers, and they were calling an API, and a bunch of salespeople, and they turned it into a whole product. So now you can um, now you can score, or we do score automatically using a deep learning model that's live in production. The emotions that are predicted to be associated with different articles. To make clear, this is not about people. It's not. There's no PII, and I'm not like predicting which people are going to feel which feelings. It's just which articles are going to invoke which feelings. Uh, there was a news story about it last week, about the New York Times is selling upsells based on how you feel. Uh, it turns out that it works. Um, so it works in terms of statistical significance. It works in that when people buy it, um, they get more engagement with their ads. And most of all, it works in that people are paying for it. So we are earning multiple data scientist salaries by doing this. Um, in terms of it was my, my first experience with crowdsourcing. I don't get to do a lot of crowdsourcing in molecular biology, bioinformatics. but. Uh, that was sort of fun. You get new interactions, like people emailing you saying, hey, this was a fun task, and we think maybe you should include these new feelings. Um, there's an opportunity for interesting computational social science about figuring out uh, which feelings tends to correlate with each other. Articles that have this feeling also have that feeling. Uh, interesting statistics about how do you establish a statistically significant cutoff so that you sleep well at night, knowing that you're not making a random number generator. Um, and interesting sort of spatiotemporal information to make sure that the people you're getting information from roughly correlate with um, readership. 
the, and that, again, that too was, was weird, right? It's, I'm not used to in academia suddenly having like a whole team that then also makes this cool um, presentation file, because I definitely didn't make this presentation file, about collecting the data and cleaning the data and making a model and then deploying it as a solution. Uh, but that was something that last year we launched it without a lot of fanfare and, and made, uh, made uh, models to predict all these different emotions on all these different ad campaigns with people using it more and more every month. I've taken off the business sensi sensitive numbers, but this is a lot of, a lot of people using it. Um, and it works. And as I said, you know, it's, uh, I've never had anybody make a pitch deck before based on one of my research projects, but uh, that was kind of fun. Okay, so those are all examples of things where the business problem is solved by something where you predict. Um, what are some questions where people actually want some decision support? So um, one decision support example was a project that started in 2014. So in 2014, the New York Times wrote this report about innovation, which is just called the Innovation Report. Um, and one of the um, statements there was, we are not keeping up in the art and science of getting our uh, news to our readers. As Dean Bacay says, we want our stuff to be read. Um, so I started talking to the editor who was in charge of that. Um, and the way they were thinking about it was that in the in the dead tree age, you make a story, and your relationship with the story ends when you, when you send it to the presses. That's why people say, stop the presses. Um, but in the digital age, your relationship with the story you know, sort of just matures into its second phase once you hit pub, because then you have to think about how are you going to promote that story. It is not being read by people on you know, the kitchen table. It's being read like in the palm of their hand you know, while they wait for the light to change. So um, there's this whole other dynamic about how you promote a story. Uh, and in particular, it's promoted on all these social channels, Facebook, Twitter, anything else that you control. So to try to give some direction to editors, we said, we can build a model that's going to predict for you how well an article will do for different definitions of engagement on different social channels if you do and do not promote it, because we have enough training data for that. So we did that. It was fun. There was a lot of Java MapReduce, and then it went to Python, and then we had an API, and then it worked for us. And then we ran into the problem, which is that editors will not use Python. So <laughs> then we had to start thinking about product thinking, which again, product thinking is not like part of my background. But we had to think about how we were going to get editors to actually use this thing. Now, in prior experience, we had built some Flask apps, some very simple GUIs. But again, like they have their workflow, and they're not going to stop doing what they're doing to open up a new app. But fortunately for us, right around that time in 2014, the editors were all falling in love with Slack. <laughs> So I don't know if you know what Slack is. How many people know what Slack is? OK, everybody now, oh, sorry. Now everybody knows what Slack is. Anyway, so Slack is like IRC, but it's good. And you can program it. And you can program all these sort of bots that you interact with. And so we, we didn't even have to think about a GUI, which is good, because I don't know how to draw. Um, we just had to think about a command line interface, which is the world we live in anyway. So we made this um, Slack bot. And then we had product questions like, what should we call it? Should we call it HAL or Terminator THX 9000? No, you should call it something that is non-threatening, like Blossom. Because it's like a flower, and then you water it, and then it blossoms. And then Colin Russell, who's the software engineer, made a, a, a Slack account for himself and an icon of a teddy bear. Colin is not like a teddy bear, but it's a good sort of non-threatening icon for him and for the bot. And then you can ask the bot, well, what should I be posting on Facebook right now? Or what should I be posting on Twitter right now from the sports desk? And so editors can get some um, suggestions from them. Again, uh, you need things that are uh, predictive and performant, but not necessarily interpretable, because they're, uh, at the moment, they're not interested in knowing what are the important features. Um, they just want this thing to work. We leveraged a lot of literature there. Um, so there was already prior art by John Kleinberg and collaborators at um, Yahoo. Lars, who's now running the applied machine learning team for the newsfeed at, at Facebook had already worked on trying to think about when you should schedule things to be promoted. Kleinberg, again, working with Lada Adamic, um, many of you I'm sure know from her time here, worked on is it even possible to predict um, how much engagement a story we're going to get. Um, workers at Microsoft Research, uh, Duncan Watts, other people that you, you probably know well, uh, had worked on how hard it is to, promote, to predict things once it's already, before it's been promoted. But one of the things they said is, if you're willing to wait 15 minutes and flight something, you get a lot more predictive power just by having it in market. You can really predict what's going to happen, which is what we did. So um, this was an example where we framed something as a prediction problem, but really what they want is decision support. What they really want is, is to help making a difficult decision. Uh, I should clarify one thing, which is that this is data-informed but not data-driven, because 
the editors who do use this, I assure you, are more than comfortable saying, eh, I don't believe that. So um, it, it makes a suggestion for them, but it's definitely not obligatory. Uh, that's one example of decision making with um, human in the loop. One type of decision making that has less human in the loop is recommendation. So recommendation can be very difficult for a variety of reasons, some of them mathematical, some are software engineering, but most of them product. Particularly, we talk about recommending content. For example, Facebook has to recommend content to you, but it's drawing in about a billion URLs a day. Uh, and it's distributing across about 2 billion uh, monthly active users. At the New York Times, we have less content. So um, we're not taking things from the open web. We're taking things from about 300 URLs a day. And in these problems, we're talking about things where it's a much smaller pool of like 10 to 30 stories that have been editorially blessed as being of a particular um, type. And it's being presented not in an unstructured feed, but in a couple of little structured widgets. For example, uh, in 2018, we were looking at recommendation for election stories. So election stories is a particular subtype of content. And they are of interest to people, but different people in different parts of the country care about different elections. So rather than ask all the editors carefully to an annotate and guess, maybe this is interesting in Michigan, but maybe also Ohio, we just said, look, let's let go and let data uh, and try to figure out from engagement which things are the, um, the articles people are going to engage with. We did this using a, a type of reinforcement learning called a contextual bandit. Um, so uh, that was uh, useful, and it inspired a lot of questions because as we were building out contextual bandits, a lot of people said, well, what would happen if this breaks? And what would happen if this happens? And what would happen in this other edge cases? And sometimes I knew the answer, and sometimes I didn't. Uh, so it provoked uh, a lot of interesting research questions wearing my other hat at, at Columbia in reinforcement learning. So just so I know my audience, how many people have heard of reinforcement learning? Good. OK, so people often talk about machine learning as having two types, supervised and unsupervised. But some other people say, actually, there's a third type. There's reinforcement learning. Um, if you haven't heard of reinforcement learning, it's gotten a lot of press in the last few years. One sort of uh, flashpoint moment was this paper from 2015 where um, Google DeepMind had deep reinforcement learning learn how to play a bunch of Atari games. Um, now you can go to their website and they have this little graphic that says DQN for deep uh, Q learning networks. So they've really gone on into it. And, and more generally in the CS community, there's been a bunch of papers about game playing with reinforcement learning which in some ways is, was the original context of the phrase machine learning, if you know, is from a 1959 paper about learning how to play uh, chess. Um, and in business. So in business, um, Stitch Fix, which has a, like 100 data scientists who write a lot of blog posts, just wrote this blog post recently about using contextual bandits to personalize um, who gets what things on Stitch Fix. Um, the reason it's called bandit is from the idea of a one-armed bandit. So the abstraction is you're in Las Vegas, you've got a bag of quarters, you have like an hour, and you want to make as much money as possible, and there are six slot machines in front of you, also known as one arm bandits. To be clear, the goal is not to learn the likelihood of the bad arms and the good arms. The goal is to make as much money as possible. Uh, and so the abstraction is that these six, machine, this, these six one arm bandits are like one six arm bandit, which is why this is called a multi arm bandit, or simply a bandit. Um, it generalizes things that you know from statistics. So like Ari Fisher told us in 1925, we should do a randomized control trial. If you're in business, a randomized control trial is called an A-B test. Uh, the downsides to doing that is that it's slow and that you have to have a meeting. Uh, but <laughs> if you let go and let code, then you can just write um, a little JavaScript hack that will learn rapidly which is the variant that's winning and upweight the variant that's winning. So then you don't need to take a meeting. Uh, common ways to do this include doing the thing that's best, and then every now and then doing something at random, or doing the thing that's best, putting a confidence interval, and choosing the thing that has the best mean plus confidence variable, the upper bound of that confidence interval. Um, or something that seems really dumb, because it was published in 1933, which is uh, just choose the thing that you think is best based on your current model of the world. Uh, and, and this is a really old idea, like 1933 old. Um, and so usually this this idea, which is called Thompson sampling, was sort of page N of the paper you compare against Thompson sampling. And so some researchers at Yahoo did that in 2011. And much to their annoyance, I assume, Thompson sampling beat their fancy technique, which is really <laughs> super cool. Uh, it was the same year that a, a colleague of mine at Columbia published an information theoretic proof that Thompson sampling was actually information theoretic optimal. So suddenly, there was a bunch of interest in Thompson sampling over the last few years. Uh, here's a citation graph. The paper was published in 1933. <laughs> <laughs> it 
dormant, <laughs> dormant. You know, the guy, the guy died here. You know, his graduate students all died around here. For <laughs> BAMO, 2005, it is hugely the winner. So if you're ever worried about your citation count, it may be just that you're 80 years too early. <laughs> uh, but this is, this is now coin of the realm in industry. For example, you can use Google Analytics, and Google Analytics now comes with a Thompson, or with a, yeah, with a Thompson sampling widget. What's cool for people who like probability is that it's, it's basically probability. You need a probability model of the, the world given the data. You are willing to put a prior belief about your parameters. You sample from that posterior probability. You do the best you can, and you repeat. So for simple cases, like let's say your payoff is 0, 1. You either get a quarter or you don't, uh, depending on which arm you need to choose. All you have to do is keep track of the successes on every arm and the failures on every arm. Sample from the, the relevant distribution, which is a um, Bernoulli with a beta prior. So it's, I don't know, it's the distribution you would expect for 0, 1 uh, rewards. And then update those simple sufficient statistics. So we've been doing that. Um, so we've been doing that at the New York Times in some very simple cases, not, not much better than Thompson's would have done, I'm sure. But it's inspired a bunch of research about how you can do that better for difficult cases. So one thing that might worry you is, OK, probability is great, but for probability for complex modeling, it gets real, real hard real fast. So um, given the way I was raised, one of the things we've been publishing on is how can you use lessons from statistical physics. Like statistical physics has like 120 years of experience of trying to approximate probability distributions. For example, by variational means or by Monte Carlo methods, um, what does a variational method look like? Well, it looks like a graphical model where the variational approximation, if you're doing approximate variational methods, is missing one edge. So um, this is an example of how you could do something like a mixture model for some real valued reward. Like imagine you pull the arm and sometimes it gives you a dollar, but then every now and then it gives you $50, or $51. Um, and the approximating distribution is almost the same, only missing one edge. And just taking that one edge suddenly makes all the math much simpler. You end up with something that looks like the analog of, of expectation maximization, depending on how you're raised, or m equals tanch beta m, depending on how you're raised. It's the same idea. Um, another technique was to take uh, filtering methods from Monte Carlo methods, uh, and you evaluate the model with a couple of parameter settings, but you're willing to put in some drift for the probability that those probabilities, that the parameters drift in time, and you end up with something that looks remarkably like genetic algorithms, where you actually have previous examples. You, you upweight the probability or sampling those prior um, examples. You allow them to drift a little bit in the genetic sense. I never thought I would use genetic algorithms in a talk, but in fact, it, it really just pops out directly from looking at the mathematics and particle filtering methods. Why do you want drift? Well, sometimes people change. So in simulations, you can do things like have two different arms, and suddenly, you know, at time 50, one of the arms totally changes its worldview and its reward structure, and then changes back at 100, and you can see that um, again, this is fake data, so if you choose data that's from the same model, you can follow that and track it along. OK, so those are examples of prediction, description, prediction, and prescription. Uh, at a high level, you know, what do you learn by spending some time in industry? Um, one of the things, and I'm always looking for things that like do industrial data science and academic data science have anything to teach each other. Um, it's particularly difficult, though, in industry because there's also like, uh, a bunch of people, and you have to work with real people. So I spent some time reading about bureaucracies and how they function or not. And uh, one useful literature was from United States Air Force and military. And um, there was a US Air Force colonel who said, if you want to get anything done, you need people, ideas, and things in that order. Uh, and I think that's been really true. That as a thing person, I tend to really focus on the things, like um, you know, AI, machine learning, and, and various thing ideas. And they are really important. For example, uh, here's an infographic from um, Monica Rigatti, who's a PhD at CMU, and then she went to LinkedIn, and she wrote this blog post 2017 about how companies always want to hire somebody to do AI, but often if you're the first person doing data science or AI, you get there and there's a problem, which is that nobody has built the pipes yet. That uh, really, if you want to get things done in, in process, you really need to make sure somebody has already thought carefully about logging all the data, what is the state of the sensors, um, and then, are you do you have ETL, which is a very old term? You know, it's not it doesn't it doesn't you know show up on Hacker News, but uh, you need it um, and reliable data flow. Then you can start thinking about how you filter the data. Then you can start thinking about fancy A/B tests, analytics, and then you can think, start thinking about the AI. So when I showed up in 2013 at the New York Times and I made a PDF, it was sort of a provocation, but we really did not have the sort of data infrastructure at the time to integrate things into process. Now I would say clearly we do. 
um, ideas that are useful. This idea about do you really want a description or a prediction or a prescription, that's been really useful. And, and I do think that it's uh, somewhat useful when you're working with any collaborator, industry or natural science. Um, sometimes they come to you and they say, cluster the data. I remind you that when Mike Eisen put his data on the internet in an Excel format from his microarray data in 1998, it was along with a clustering algorithm. In 1998, that was how you made sense of biological data. You clustered it. Why? Well, you know, Eisen's brother was coming from phylogeny. It's not real clear that clustering was the right thing to do with gene microarray data in 1998. That was just something somebody knew how to do, put his data out there in Excel and, and shared code for clustering. And de facto, people were like, OK, well, that's what you do with, with microarrays. Genes are to be clustered. It was really like tool set drove people's mindset. Uh, the other thing that I've learned in industry is uh, the best AI is AI plus in real life interaction. So like, there are times when some editor has said, we'd like it if you do this thing. And then me and my team disappeared into a math cave for six months and then came back and did the thing. And I said, oh, that's interesting. And then they never used it. So um, it's really important that you actually have somebody interact with you and talk to you regularly. I now tell people on my team at the Times, if somebody asks you to do something, they should pay for it. And they should pay for it by meeting with you at least 15 minutes a week every week. And if they don't want to meet with you every 15 minutes a week, then they don't they really care if you do it or not. Um, Another thing that I think has been true in industry and in, in academia is the importance of interpretability. So in lots of engineering problems, you really don't care why you have a theory of optical character recognition. But in the natural sciences and also in the computational social sciences, like marketing, uh, you actually want to know like what is the model doing and why do people want to engage with the product. Interpretability helps you with weird edge cases that you couldn't predict. And interpretability helps you. Um, predict what's going to happen if you go in and change the system. Right? Just because you have a, 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 a supervised learning model that works well doesn't mean that when you go in and change one of the things, it will behave the way you expect. Um, DARPA is also on board with this. There's a DARPA call for proposals from a few, a few years ago on explainable AI. So even DARPA is saying, well, maybe we should not just think about prediction power. Maybe we should think about interpretation. The people stuff, though, I think is the most important thing. So. Um, in industry, people have, have sort of matured the way they talk about data science. So like in 2010, when people talk about data science, they include all of that stuff that Jeff Hammerbacher meant. You know, building a data science pr uh, pipeline, visualizing the data, running an A-B test. Now there's separate teams and separate groups of people. So at the times, I'm in this big data group, and there's separate data analysts and data scientists and data engineers, and they do separate stuff. Uh, whereas in academia, I think we have a, a, a a temptation to just call all that data science or just call that all data stuff. Uh, but at this point, things are maturing, and an industry is really calling all of these different skill sets different job titles. Um, data governance is one of those job titles, uh, which I, I think is, is not to be neglected. So when I showed up at the time, David, data governance was like, um, this vendor says we have this many clicks, but that vendor says this many clicks. How do we reconcile that? Now data governance is about like who should have access to those data, why even are we keeping that data, what is the deletion policy for those data? And that has become really uh, paramount in the last few years. Um, I don't know how many of you saw this uh, announcement of a year-long project from the opinion section of the New York Times about privacy. Uh, but if you click through to the um, article from the publisher, he says specifically, I talked to the data team to figure out like what is our PII that we're tracking. And then we tried to think through, like what can we get rid of? Um, should, do we even need those trackers? Um, and tried to think through that because data governance now in 2019 in the States really also means responsible use of data and, and thinking through um, particularly PII. Uh, the other side of people is who we hire. So um, as I said, the data group is a big like 100-person team. Data analytics is, is like 70 people. Data science is like eight. Uh, and we've tried to hire um, people coming from a variety of backgrounds. So um, Anne's an astrophysicist by training, but an astrophysicist who's basically doing the back-end systems work for a multinational collaborator. She's great. Um, uh, Colin's coming from EE. Uh, Anna, who did the Turker work, is coming from CogSci. She did a bunch of Mechanical Turk work in her PhD. Uh, JD's coming from Math Finance, actually did time in finance. Um, Julie's coming from Applied Math as a background. Andrew's a pure mathematician, and we just hired a woman who's got her, getting her PhD in seismology. Uh, but we are still hiring, and we try, to, we try to get people from a diversity of backgrounds. I found that PhDs often flourish, right? Like a PhD is a good training. Um, for the collaborative nature of that, it's also useful to have people who have been in industry and, and know how to work well with others uh, in a collaboration. Uh, with that, I think I'm nearing the end of my time as promised, which is 4.50, so I think I'll take some questions.
Thank you. I do it? Yeah, you can run. Good. Take, take questions. First. Questions, please. Uh, thanks for a great talk. I have a question about data governance. Yeah. And how your team interacts with it, both ways of terms of having influence and getting information back from it. Does it like the example, does the data governance committee have a technical representative on it? Yeah, I mean, they're already reasonably technical people. So the data governance team, which, which is a team of three people, are coming, people coming from a background in standards. Uh, some people, one, a woman who's been like for 20 years at the company is as basically a DBA uh, and knows where all the data are. Um, and uh, another person who I think is really good at standards and documentation, and they sit across from me. So like, I, 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 like, I look at Robin. Robin is the guy who runs the data governance team. So like, we are physically juxtaposed. So everyone at data analytics, data science, data engineering, we're all sitting on the south side of the fifth floor. Um, so communication is not hard. Um, that is just the data governance team, but one of the most important things they did was to democratize that by creating a DRB, a data research um, DRB or board, IRB, what's the B? Institutional Review Board, board. Data Review Board, uh, long day. And that data review board is drawn with people from across the company, with ambassadors from across the company, to make sure that everybody surfaces poten potential gray areas or just qu questions in a way that's done more collaboratively. Like, um, Robin always says that we try to design for ethics rather than enforce ethics so that everybody wants to talk to the data governance team. Uh, but yes, they are, they are sufficiently technical that they actually know what they're talking about, particularly the DBA who's been there for 20 years. She, actually, she, she deeply knows where all the bodies are buried. Yes, please. Uh, so throughout your talk, uh, at least I thought that most of the problems that you presented were from the business side of things. Yes. Um, well, so the New York Times has the attribute that they're, it's organized around a craft, and it's one of the best places in the world at the craft. So um, I try not to get in the way of that craft. Uh, I mean, the way journalists use data is stuff that you can see with your eyes. Like, you can go to the upshot, you can, you can look at the graphics work. That's, that's the challenges the newsroom has around data. And um, I, I've tried not to... Not, not to get in there. I mean, like, I know them, I talk to them, we're friends, but I try not to get in their way for a couple of reasons. One is they have deadlines, and that to me sounds very stressful. I don't want to have deadlines. Uh, and the other is, um, you know, like, the only thing that's a differentiator between the New York Times and other companies is that they, they're pretty real good at journalism. Like, if I were to try to augment them or replace them with algorithms, then, you know, I'm not going to be able to keep up with Google, right? Like, if some other, if other company decides, you know, we're going we're gonna to algo our way to news judgment, I'm not going to be able to beat them. Right? So I would rather that they do what they do and I'll do stuff uh, not in the newsroom. Like the most important decisions that the company makes every day are definitely the decisions for which news judgment is relevant. But the, for the remaining like 90% of, of decisions that the company overall has to make, there's, there's all sorts of ways to use data to make those decisions better. Some of the projects I should say are with the newsroom, but they're with editors rather than journalists. So there's a lot of things we can do to help process. Uh, and we've, we both have successfully and not successfully flighted various tooling to help the editors uh, make process more efficient. But um, with, with journalists, you know, like I, I consult with them. If I can help them, great. Uh, but very little of the things that we do in the group are seen by people. We're not getting any bylines except for one or two cases where we've done like additional reporting to help them with a terrible database or something. Please. Um, great talk. Thank you so much. I mean, bias and fairness come up all the time. I mean, th they come up a lot when I'm talking to journalists who write about it, for example. So like, you know, talking to, I don't know, I don't want to name names, but like people that I talk to about bias and fairness, we talk about it a lot. But in terms of the processes that we run, you know, most of the products that we build are internal products. And some of the fairness issues that come up, for example, let's say that I train a dating set, data set on one, one demographically homogenous group and then I deploy that algorithm on a totally different group. That's one of the cases that you get um, um, accusations of bias, for example. 
most of the things we do, like we're training it and testing on pretty much the same group, which is New York Times readers or New York Times subscribers, respectively. Um, so the only case, so we don't have a lot of cases where we feel like we're we have ethical gray zones in what we do internally. Um, less and less so as we move away from using PII. So for example, the analysis of feelings was at the article level, not at the people level. So it's like a deep analytics of content, not a deep analytics of people. Or the Blossom Project, right? There's nothing personalized in there. So um, a lot of the interesting AI that we're doing is not for anything that differentiates people from each other. It's, it's an analysis of articles or analysis of content rather than of people. Please. Yeah, off-platform is really hard and dynamic. So the projects I work on don't leverage off-platform data. Um, by the way, Apple News, whether or not it, it changes the game, depends on whether or not publishers choose to engage in a, a relationship with Apple News. Some publishers have and some publishers haven't. Um, yeah, uh, off-platform data is hard and dynamic, and you're at the mercy of somebody else's DBAs or you know shutting down their APIs or God knows what. So it, I mean, it's hard enough to deal with internal data, but I haven't done anything with external off-platform data. You know, we deal, we deal with the referrer data that we track. So that was another, th another reason why it was useful to show up at the New York Times in January of 20, or summer of 2013, is that in fall of 2012, they had just spent a bunch of investment to make their own internal, um, internal event tracking system, which is called Event Tracker. So they, they just created it in the fall of 2012, so it was only when I showed up in spring of 2013 that they suddenly found themselves awash in data, and I showed up and said, hey, I know how to make sense of lots of data. Is there anything we can do? And they said, yes, we have a bunch of data. You should look at it. Other questions? Please. So as a consumer of the website, one of the things that I've always wondered is, what am I not seeing that's actually in the paper itself? So can you talk a little bit about, is, is the entire content of the New York Times on the website? And what's the decision process for what isn't readily seeable on the website? Yeah, I think it's the other way around. I think there's more stuff digitally than there is in print. Yeah, yeah, because there's all sorts of you know blogs and experiments and interactives and uh, things like that that's being produced just for the web only that doesn't ever make it to print. So then the question about um, what are the things that are produced digitally that's going to go into print is a great one that you should ask an editor on the newsroom side. I don't really have a lot of visibility into that. I can help you out on that. Okay. Yes, that's. Oh, good, good, good. Yeah. <laughs> Which is, which is different from olden times when, uh, as you know, Matt, Matt Erickson and others would like do something in print and then they would send it to Electronic Media, which was a separate company, and say, here's, some here's, some graphic, here's a graphics file, see what you can do with it. And they would find a way to put it on the internet. Chris, you have a question for me in the Please. Uh, so referring back to the comment about the results prediction, I was wondering, so you have given quite a few interesting examples of where it was within the, the limits. Uh, that you were able to uh, do a good job. So I was wondering if you have some examples of where perhaps that was beyond the limits. So where it you mean technically not, did not work out that well, or maybe you should not be uh, actually attempting. So you're asking two questions. One is technical, and the other is ethical. Yes. Um, yeah, golly. Um, so in terms of technical things, at one point, I, so another thing that's been anthropologically interesting is going on advertising sales calls, just because I want to know, like, who are these people? You know, uh, marketing people. Like, how do they think? So I was on one of them, and somebody said, "Well, can you tell us? Can you figure out who's an influencer?" And I didn't say that's completely meaningless. And why would you want that? I said, "That's a great question. I'll get back to you." <laughs> um, so, so then I spent some time thinking about how you would tell somebody who's an influencer, and I, and I. We, we did this project where we looked at, um, for a very small subset of people, th like old agent data, they had said, here's, here's my, some social platform creden credentials or username or something. And then you could see if you could find any correlation between what they were reading and any of their social metrics. And at least in our hands, we found nothing. Uh, and it may be just because there was more to be done, but 
in, in the end, you know, I had other fish to fry, so I, I didn't I didn't spend a lot of time looking into it. And in terms of things that you shouldn't do, I, I, usually when I give talks, people ask all sorts of questions about like, oh, could you tell the editors they should publish more happy stories? And I say, I could do that, but then they would kick me out of the building. Like that, <laughs> that would be really not strategic. Um, so yeah, ethically, there's all sorts of things where people are like, oh, well, can you predict how well a story is going to do based on the byline? Or could you predict how much revenue you lose if people read articles by a certain author, you know, just based on observational data, which as you know, has plenty of confounders that would make it all meaningless. And then, yeah, there's all sorts of things we could do, which, that, which, which would be like very bad for um, my time there, but also like bad for like the relationship between the New York Times and data, right? You can do all sorts of like spurious correlations. Um, or you know, even predicting how well a story is going to do is, is full of confounders like how we promoted the story. So there's a lot of things that you think are interesting, but if you thought through it, you would think, oh, that's actually not doable. Please. Um, how much data do reporters get about how, how well their stories are doing? And how, does that, how have you seen that impact the sort of journalism that gets done. Mm. Um, so years ago, the New York Times built an internal dashboard tool called Stella, um, which is a backronym for something I can't remember, um, but gives editors and journalists, so gives anyone who uses the tool a view into uh, views and time spent on an article as a function of time. It was rolled out first to editors, and then once editors felt comfortable with it, it was rolled out to journalists. Um, and over the years, it has been augmented to include things like indicate the moment when a headline was changed or indicate the moment it was promoted or something like that. Not my team, since I consider it something that doesn't involve machine learning, and I try to, stay, I try to limit myself to things that are going to involve machine learning somehow. There's already plenty of great people to do other things. Um, in terms of how has it changed things, you know, I hope not at all, because if you talk to editors, they say what we're looking for is impact. And impact is conveniently not something that's quantifiable. Sometimes impact is a Pulitzer Prize. Sometimes impact is state attorney general it launches an investigation. Sometimes impact is hundreds of thousands of people read the dialect quiz. So it's, it's clear that you know, people are willing to take a lot of different things as impact, many of which cannot be counted, even though they're easy to count. Um, sorry, many of which don't count, even though they're easy to be counted. Um, behind your question is really a question about management. Right? The thing that makes numbers dangerous is when managers think that the number is a proxy for quality. As an example, um, Gawker, as a newspaper, famously advocated for using metrics not only to um, uh, adjudicate who's a good reporter, but how much to pay them. And they did that by putting a big board in front of all of the journalists, which was called the big board. And the big board would show them in real time how many people had clicked on different stories. And they did the experiment for us as a species, and we know how that experiment ended. So in some ways, the New York Times has last mover advantage. Because we already know what it looks like when somebody tries to reward journalism based on clicks. And nobody in the newsroom wants that to happen. Um, so rolling out metrics like that was done very slowly uh, and with a lot of uh, deliberation about what it would mean and what it would not mean. Um, and you know, with a careful rollout of being shown to editors first and then journalists. As far as how it impacts into people's promotion and retention, that is a, that is a set of HR conversations to which I assure you I'm not privy. Uh, but at least in terms of public statements about, about what, it, what matters to people in the newsroom, what matters to people in the newsroom is, is impact uh, and not clicks. All right, this is great. Thank you. Thank you sure. so much.